بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وسيد المرسلين سيدنا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم صل وسلم وأنعم وأكرم وبارك عليه في الأولين وصل وسلم وأنعم وأكرم وبارك عليه في الآخرين وصل وسلم وأنعم وأكرم وبارك عليه في الملأ الأعلى إلى يوم الدين we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these uh, moments that we are spending time together and that is uh, at least if you're on the east coast uh, of the US um, these hours or these uh, moments before uh, Salatul Maghrib uh, this time as the sun is setting is a time of tafakkur and tadabbur it's a time of um, reflection and thought and contemplation and uh, alhamdulillah you know, we have as our uh, company today in this uh, uh, particular journey of thinking and reflecting and remembering, um, as we have been covering over the past many weeks, the um, hikam of Ibn Ata'illah, the beautiful aphorisms and wisdoms of um, Ibn Ata'illah Sekandari, this great uh, spiritual master and sage and uh, wise, uh, pious predecessor of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And um, today's hikmah, today's wisdom in particular, is um, pretty involved. It's a, it's a very rich hikmah, it's a very rich wisdom, um, it's a very heavy wisdom. Um, it's actually the longest wisdom uh, amongst the wisdoms of Ibn Ata'illah, the roughly 260 wisdoms. This is uh, the longest one amongst them. And... Um, uh, really to do it justice uh, requires uh, hours and hours because of how rich uh, and full of um, very prudent and thoughtful uh, theological considerations. Ibn Ata'illah is really challenging us to think deeper and deeper and deeper in a more nuanced in a more deliberate fashion and that's the beauty of these wisdoms is how they challenge us um, to go beyond that which is superficial, and I'll you know I'll tell you right now it's the 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 day and age that we live in. It's really um, painful <laughs> and painstaking and uh, and agonizing uh, to think uh, deeper than the superficial. Um, it's something that we our our minds have become so conditioned to process information. Uh, at surface value or at face value, we just want a kind of we want a one and done kind of disposition, and um, that's not what Ibn Ata'illah is about. You know, Ibn Ata'illah, uh, after these first fifteen wisdoms, he comes to this wisdom number sixteen, and he starts to. It's almost as if he's having a hal. He's going through a state, and you can, if you pay attention, you can you can feel. Um, his words, you can feel the state that he was in. He was being very expressive in this hikmah, almost to say um, in a rhetorical fashion, um, dismissing the naysayers. Right? Uh, you have a succession of what are known as uh, istifham istinkari, rhetorical questions. But these, these istifhamat, these, this line of questioning that he's, we're about to experience together, it's being done in a spirit of you know dismissiveness with an interlocutor who he is now finding to be so heavy headed you know and so obtuse and so unwilling to open up their eyes and so he just like you know pellets us with these questions to kind of wake us up and say hey pay attention to the reality and so inshallah you know i want you to a channel the, the spirit of Ibn Ata'illah as we've gone through the first 15 hikam, these first 15 wisdoms, and especially the last wisdoms, the last three, four, which are very relevant to today's, and all of them are interconnected in some way, but we spoke about, you know, that uh, everything is dark, and what brought light is the uh, existence of the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we spoke in the past weeks about lightness and darkness, and we spoke about the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that um, He is the one who veils Allah jalla fi ula. He veils the eyes by His qahri reality, by His power. Of course, to those who um, deserve that reality. And so today, 
Ibn Atayullah is saying, well, you know, enough is enough. Enough is enough. And so he asks these questions. يقول الإمام ابن عطاء الله رحمه الله ونفعنا الله بعلومه في الدارين آمين كيف يتصور أن يحجبه شيء وهو الذي أظهر كل شيء وكيف يتصور أن يحجبه شيء وهو الذي ظهر بكل شيء وكيف يتصور أن يحجبه شيء وهو الذي ظهر في كل شيء كيف يتصور أن يحجبه شيء وهو الذي ظهر لكل شيء كيف يتصور أن يحجبه شيء وهو الظاهر قبل وهو الظاهر قبل وجود كل شيء كيف يتصور أن يحجبه شيء وهو أظهر من كل شيء كيف يتصور أن يحجبه شيء وهو الواحد الذي ليس معه شيء كيف يتصور أن يحجبه شيء وهو أقرب إليك من كل شيء كيف يتصور, وكيف يتصور أن يحجبه شيء ولولاه ما كان وجود كل شيء يا عجبا كيف يظهر الوجود في العدم أم كيف يثبت الحادث مع من له وصف القدم This is heavy <laughs> and even for Arabic readers I'm certain if you're hearing and uh, you're still trying to process what exactly he's saying. But let me read the translation, inshallah. We're going to do a very simple treatment of a line by line and then open up for Q&A, inshallah. So he's saying here in these uh, uh, line of rhetorical questioning, almost in a dismissive fashion, how can it be conceived that something veils him, something veils Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, since he is the one who manifests everything. And how can it be conceived that something veils Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala since he is the one who is manifest through everything? And how can it be conceived that something veils him since he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the one who is manifest in everything? And how can it be conceived that something veils him since he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the manifest to everything? And how can it be conceived that something veils him since he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was the manifest before the existence of anything? How can it be conceived that something veils him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, since he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is more manifest than anything. How can it be conceived that something veils him, since he is the one who alongside of whom there is nothing? How can it be conceived that something veils him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, since he is nearer to you than anything? How can it be conceived that something veils him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, since were it not for him, the existence of everything would not have been manifest. It is truly a marvel, he says, how being, quote-unquote, has manifested in non-being, and how the contingent has been established alongside of whom possesses the attribute of eternity. Radiallahu anhu. I know it's heavy, but may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to get through it in a meaningful fashion and to really process the subtlety and the nuance in each one of these line items, if you will, that he is expressing in such a vociferous and uh, in expressive fashion, he's really he's really experiencing the juhud of the jahid. You know, there are those who are detractors and naysayers, those who reject Allah, those who insist on not seeing Allah, those who insist on not observing Allah, those who are ignorant from the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the ever-present reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he is going at this line of questioning and each one of these is a theological nuance point 
that is ultimately saying one thing. Allah is there. You know, pay attention. Wake up already. <laughs> Allah is here. You know? And and stop getting lost in in the weeds and in that which is not there at the expense of the one who is there. Allah Jalla fi So he begins, and you'll see the logical progression of how he builds his line of rhetorical questioning. He says, How can it be conceived that someone veils him since he is the one who manifested everything? Allahu khaliqu kulli shay. This is the first point. How can anything, how can it be conceived that anything in this world, anything that is seen, anything that is perceived, whether it is conceived of here or seen in creation, how can any of that veil him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he is the one who has manifested everything that we see? Okay, so that's the starting point. Allah created everything. And then he says, And how can it be conceived that something veils him since he is the one who is manifest through everything? So it's one thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifested everything but it's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought things into existence and then somehow is disconnected from those things which is the assumption or the perception of some philosophers that Allah is detached or disconnected no Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is manifest through these things meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is attached to all of the realities in terms of sustainability that these creations as we see them playing out in us and around us, it exists by and through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you see Ibn Atayla saying, okay, first and foremost, Allah manifested everything. Secondly, the only way this stuff is being sustained, the only way this stuff is being continued, meaning the the, the dawaran al-aflaq, you know, the way in which the sun and the moon's motion, the galaxies, how they orbit uh, our realities, the alternation of the night and the day, right? The continuation of the human condition, the shifting and the changing of seasons, all of these are what? The manifesting of Allah through our realities. Then the third question, istifam mustinkari, is, how can it be conceived that something veils him? So Allah, how can it be that anything veils him? Since he is the one who is manifest in everything. right? And this is another dimension, another level of the subtlety and the nuance and the lutf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's zahiri orientation, meaning that he is ever existent. Because if you go into the microscopic level of the human being or of creation, Allah is witnessed in those realities. Fi, right? And this is in no way, shape, or form to indicate or to note that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is those things or that Allah is in those things. Walakin huwa mawjudun fihi bisrifatihi. Allah is in these things through his characteristics so when you look when you look at the finger and you and you look at how it, it's able to to contract and then extend and you look at all the subtleties of of what's happening in the skin and the nail and you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creative capacity al-khaliq al-bari'u al-musawwir the one who fashions and creates all of these realities Right? The subtlety of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence through his create through his sifat in every every nanosecond and every millimeter of existence. So when I hold a, a, a tree, I hold a leaf, and I, I look at its color, and I look at the veins of the leaf, and I see how it's rooted in the stem. And then the stem is grounded into 
a twig, and then the twig is inside a branch, and then the branch is a part of a trunk, and then the trunk is deep into the earth through its roots. And all of that started with a small little fragile leaflet. And then subhanAllah, it expands and grows and grows. Is that not the creative capacity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifest in every single thing? Those of us who've watched our children grow, we've seen them when they were in their wombs, the mother's womb as they were, you know, the, the, the size of a, of a pea. And then they grow to the size of a, of a bean. And then they grow to a, a golf ball and then an egg. And then they grow slowly and slowly and slowly. And they grow until they become a, 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 a functioning little being. And even in the smaller of states, subhanAllah, they're still full beings, but they're very small. And then they're birthed out of the mother. And then they look like, a, you know, just a, <laughs> a big blob at times. You know, barely being able to function. Their motor skills are very limited. They're, you know, they kind of open their mouths and their eyes are barely. And then so slowly things to be, start to become refined and well-developed. And you see the shift, the, the ability of the muscles and the contraction, the sight begins to become sharper. And then words start to become uttered. And you see the slow profound divine you know presence in these uh, these creations as Allah grows them and sustains them and fashions them and evolves them as they are right and that is the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being fi right in these things right and that's what is noted here and as we as we follow the logical progression and this is how he wants us to think. He's talking to those who want to contemplate and to those who are stubborn about not contemplating. So he starts, Allah, Allah manifested everything. Everything that exists is Allah's manifest through it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in every, every corner of this reality. بِعِلْمِهِ By his knowledge, by his khalq. Uh, by his haymana, his, his control, etc. Then the fourth question. How can it be conceived that something veils him since he is the manifest to everything? How can it be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is veiled when Allah is manifest to everything? Meaning that everything witnesses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ibrahim, shak? Is there, can there be a doubt about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? فَاطِرِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. أَلَمْ تَرَى أَنَّ اللَّهَ In, the, in Surah, uh, in surah, uh, surah Al-Isra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, or Surah Al-Hajj, sorry. أَلَمْ تَرَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَسْجُدُ لَهُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ وَالنُّجُومُ وَالْجِبَالُ وَالشَّجَرُ وَالدَّوَابُ وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنَ النَّاسِ وَكَثِيرٌ حَقَّ عَلَيْهِ الْعَذَابُ وَمَنْ يُهِنِ اللَّهُ فَمَا لَهُ مِنْ مُكْرِمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَفْعَلُ مَا يَشَاءُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hajj, do you not realize? O Prophet, that everything in the heavens and everything in the earth submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sun, the moon, the stars, the mountains, the trees, the animals, all of this is in submission. So do many human beings, though so do many human beings, though for many others punishment is well deserved. And so here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indicating everything is in submission. Everything has no doubt about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says, and so is the case with many human beings. But he's noting here, not all human beings. For many others, punishment is well deserved. Anyone disgraced by Allah will have no one to honor him. God does whatever He wills. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Isra, تُسَبِّحُ لَهُ السَّمَاوَاتُ السَّبْعُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَمَنْ فِيهِنَّ وَإِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ 
بحمده ولكن لا تفقهون تسبيحهم إنه كان حليما غفورا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the seven heavens all of the heavens and the earth and everyone in them everyone ومن فيهن this is للإطلاق والعموم this is to indicate an all-encompassing reality glorify him there is not a single thing that does not celebrate his praise though you do not understand their praise so what is Ibn Atayla saying here? These are some verses to emphasize the point that he's making. See, it's not only that Allah manifested everything, and then Allah manifested through everything, and then Allah manifested in every is manifest in everything. But everything witnesses the manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the odd man out and it is the very few who do not witness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah here in all of these ayat is emphasizing everything is making dhikr everything is glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the trees the birds the stone everything witnesses everything experiences everything in feels you know and this is also a subtle point that he's telling us don't assume that the only pathway of knowing is the rational mind. There are plenty of people with rational minds who are mahjubin, who are veiled as we've spoken about in previous hikam, and who do not know. And the apparatus of knowing far extends far beyond the rational mind. And that's why we know that the creation feels, and the creation knows. The jamad, the hard you know, quote-unquote, lifeless entity knows and feels and remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is it not the case that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he would give a khutbah regularly and before the minbar was built for him and he would lean on a jidha, he would lean on a tree and when the minbar was built, when the platform for him to start making the khutbah was built, there was an there was an anin, there was a sound that was coming from the jidha, from the tree. A sound of sadness, a sound of loss that is no longer uh, has the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa leaning on it. And so the Prophet sallallahu after he was done with his sermon, he went and he masaha alayhi, he, 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 he rubbed and, and touched and soothed the tree. Bi rahmatihi, you know, through the mercy that was imbued, embedded in him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But here the tree felt, the animals feel, the plants feel. You know, I have an aunt, may Allah bless her. You know, she, she uh, my, my, my mother's sister, every time she would come to our house, she would look at uh, the plants and she would say, Haram alik. You know, she would say, this is, you know, Egyptians, this is a, a figure of speech, like Haram alik, like it's really wrong of you. Look at these plants, they're crying. You know, and then she would walk inside without skipping a beat, get a, a bucket of water or get a you know thing and start watering the plants, a watering pot. Because she, in her filthy state, noticed that the trees are sad or the plants are sad. And then and then when she would water them and we'd go in and we maybe have some tea and chat a little bit, she'd come back and say, Look, they're happy now. Because they're kind of, you know. They're erect and upright and ready to go. SubhanAllah, and, and they feel. The creation, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala feels. The creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet Sallallahu tells us in a hadith that, that the, the, the bird in the sky and the, the, the fish in the sea make dua and seek forgiveness for the person of knowledge, for the person of gnosis, of ma'rifah. Because they are so happy with the fact that there are those who seek to truly know. Talibul ilm, the seeker of knowledge. And that's what we have to be. We have to take these hikam of Ibn Ata'illah and we have to operate, operationalize them the way he has. You see how he's bringing nuance after nuance. And he's extracting from the Quran and Sunnah all of these subtleties of the features of existence 
and the nature of how Allah manifests. And He's showing us, listen, Allah manifests in multiple ways. And you have to notice those manifestations. And you have to notice the ordering of those manifestations. And you have to notice the reality of those manifestations. Because yes, creation is far more vast and profound and sophisticated than we as simple human beings who process things, unfortunately, on average, extremely superficially to a fault in almost a criminal fashion against the capacity of the human mind. So he's saying, no. That piece of wood, it knows Allah. You know? It witnesses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what he's saying here. How can it be conceived that something veils him since he is manifest to everything? And as Allah said in the ayah, and it's only a few people, meaning a few of his creation, that don't witness him. So brothers and sisters, where do we want to be? Do we want to be in the you know, the cosmic symphony of creation, where literally everything witnesses Allah, and everything knows Allah, and the majority of people witness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but then there are those who still remain veiled. Afillahi shak. Is there a doubt about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Absolutely not. There is no doubt in you, Ya Allah. Ya Kareem, there is no doubt in your, your, your manifest presence and existence. And we seek your forgiveness in our short-sightedness and our shortcomings and our blindedness. Allahumma ameen. Then he continues to say, How can it be conceived that something veils him since he was the one manifest before the existence of anything? How can it be conceived that something or anything veils him since he was the manifest before the existence of anything. And this is to emphasize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is al awwal wal akhir, He is qadim, lahu al qidam. There is nothing before Allah and there is nothing after Allah. And Allah is zahir. هو الأول والآخر والظاهر والباطن وهو بكل شيء عليم He is the first and He is the last and He is the manifest both outwardly and inwardly and He has knowledge of all things Surah Al-Hadid, Ayah 3 That brothers and sisters Ibn Atallah is saying listen, how can anything veil him from those of you who are veiled how can anything veil him when he was there, when there was nothing else? All of this stuff that distracts us, all of these, these dollars and this money and these interests and desires and concerns and all these you know, diseases and ailments and ups and downs, all of this stuff that we experience in our lives, none of this was. But Allah was. Allah was. As the Prophet says, كَانَ اللَّهُ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْءٌ غَيْرُهُ Allah was, and Allah is, and nothing was besides Him. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْءٌ غَيْرُهُ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْءٌ مَعْهُ There was nothing with Him, nothing other than Him. جَلَّ فِي عُلَى and this is what the Prophet, this is what Ibn Ata'illah wants us to, to process. Is that he is al awwalu wal akhir. Imagine, just pause. And really reflect on what that means for you and I. That Allah was, and Allah is. And us, we were not. None of us. Nothing was. Allah, al awwalu wal akhir. He, through his power of kun, khalaqa, he created, and then he will eviscerate. Everything will be eviscerated. And Allah will remain. 
What does this tell you about yourself? This is the question, Ibn Ata'illah. He's forcing, he's driving into our heads an idea. Allah exists. What are you distracted by other than Him? How could you, how could you conceivably be distracted? How can we conceivably be distracted of anything or by anything other than Him, Allah Jalla fi ula, when He is so evidently obvious and so evidently present and logically when you process you know that we are all created beings and that's where he transitions into the next rhetorical question in this like line of dismissive rhetorical questioning he says how can it be conceived that something veils him since he was the manifest before the existence of anything and how can it be conceived that something veils him since he is more manifest than anything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala azhara and this is the next logical reality so Allah was nothing was with him right and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought into being azhara and Allah is more obvious and more manifest clearly than the things that he brought into existence how can it be that the one who brought into existence becomes hidden and that thing that is brought into existence which is contingent which is which acts as the equivalent of a shadow how can that become more obvious it's like Imagine this, or, or think of this. We are mesmerized when we see someone draw something that is a beautiful work of art. And especially when someone captures the likeness of something else. Someone captures the likeness of a beautiful landscape. You know, the, 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 the Mount Everest. Or someone captures the likeness of a beautiful animal like a lion, someone captures the likeness of a human being. Now, what do we do when we see that likeness? We say, wow, that is impressive. That artist is really profound. Who is that artist? I would love to know who this person is. Who created this artwork? Because our minds are able to process what that is, and that is a likeness. It is not a haqiqah, it is not a reality in and of itself, but rather that there is something that brought, that someone brought that into reality, that likeness. And so Ibn Atayullah is telling us, you know, how can it be conceived that the thing that is created, the thing that was brought into existence, is seemingly to the jahid more obvious than the one who brought it into existence so no one today is going to look at a really nice painting and just be completely consumed by the painting and not be mindful of the fact that there was an artist who painted this reality who painted this this beautiful form of expression and so when we say that we observe with our eyes. When someone asks you, and you say, oh, you know, I've, I, I was observing and I noticed how um, the trees shift and change and alter, and you see the changing of the colors and the leaves and the shapes and the sizes. And so someone asks you, oh, really, so you observe that. How did you observe that? Well, you'll say, oh, with my eyes. Well, which part of the eye? How did you observe with the eye? What do you know? What do we know about the eye that enables us to observe? Which part of the eye? Can I pinpoint exactly what my eye is doing to allow me to observe? Even with the microscopic telescopes that may dissect and give us some you know, basic information about the physiology of the eye, and we may come to some greater knowledge that is beyond the superficial, but the apparatus, the entire process that connects the eye to the mind and the mind and the eye processing realities that are external, 
then bringing them somewhere internally. And then there is some light that is being shined on that entire process to bring us into a place or a position of having observed something. What is objectively more obvious here? The fact that there is a profound system at play that is really seemingly endless in its nature that enables me to conceive of something or just the simple conception of something or the simple perception of something. There's no doubt that Allah Azhar because Allah is the one who illuminates and enables me to see as we spoke about in the previous hikam. So Ibn Atayullah is saying Allah is Azhar. So how can we ever be veiled by that which is just simply perceived or simply seen, which is the equivalent of a shadow. Would a shadow ever be given a lofty standing in my heart or my mind, in my psyche, when, all, when I know with certainty that that shadow is non-existent by itself, but rather it is just existent because there is another reality that is existent. So when I see the shadow of a child, I know that that just indicates a child. I'm not going to be mesmerized by the shadow. I'm not going to be absorbed by the shadow. I'm going to realize that there is something that is creating that shadow. And that's the subtlety that Ibn Atayla wants us to note in this rhetorical question. And then the next he says, how can it be conceived that something veils him since he is the one alongside of whom there is nothing? And so this is when Ibn Ata'illah is going deeper. Say, okay, here is you're following the progression. Allah brought everything into existence. Allah threw, Allah in, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before nothing was with, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought into existence. And then he's saying, we are actually, you and I, we are just that shadow. We are not existent absolutely the way Allah is. Allah is wajibul wujud. Allah is necessarily existent. And Allah necessarily exists. And Allah exists absolutely without any aid or support. Allahu alladhi la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyumu Allah, no God but Him, He is ever living and He is qayyum, He is self-subsisting. Allah does not need anything to exist. Allah is not contingent upon anything. Allah does not require any aid or support in any way, shape or form to exist. Or as you and I, we exist 100% in a contingent state. Meaning that our existence is contingent upon Allah's will, Allah's desire. So we don't exist on our own. We exist only by and through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are possibly existent. And I know this is heavy, you know, <laughs> during Ramadan. But I want us to take some of the laborious efforts to think and to contemplate that I am not wajibul wujud. I don't necessarily exist. Evidently, I am contingent. I rely fully upon Allah. So how can it be that I get consumed by myself or by other things that only exist, you know, seemingly, whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists absolutely. And this is what Ibn Ata'illah is emphasizing in this point. He's saying, how can it be conceived that someone, veil, some, that something veils him, since he is the one alongside of whom there is nothing? Allah is the one, He is Al-Hayyul Qayyum, and alongside Him, nothing. And we 
collectively, with all this creation, we are in the category of nothingness. And that is a very humbling and critically important lesson to internalize. Because Ibn Ata'illah is challenging us and encouraging us. Stop being deceived. Stop being deluded. By everything and anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can't continue to be deluded by my feelings and my emotions and my worries and people and money and power and influence and politics and social realities. All of this stuff doesn't exist on its own. It exists by and through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu khaliqu kulli shay. So why would I be so enamored and absorbed by a disease or a virus or a political reality or political power or a, a selfish desire or an interest or, or anything that happens in creation when all of it exists in the power of be and it is by Allah kun fayakun subhanallah may Allah help us to be humbled and to internalize these ma'ani and so he then says inna Allah yumsiku as-samawati wal arda an tazula wala in zalata in amsakahuma min ahadin min ba'di Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Fatir, Surah Fatir, God keeps the heavens and earth from vanishing. If they did vanish, no one else could stop that. See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is controlling this reality. So even they have the skies that we look at. Look up in the sky and look at the earth. And who is, who is maintaining that reality? Who is keeping that reality upright as we perceive it or observe it? Allah. Fi qabdatillah. This is what the ulama of theology call ta'alluq al qabda. That every single moment it is God's constriction that is maintaining this reality. So if you just look at it from like a longitudinal perspective, every single moment. It is the divine reality maintaining and manifesting and controlling and dictating. So if Allah were to, if you will, let go, the sky would fall. And the earth would be eviscerated. And the soul would not return to the body. That's why we say in the dua at night before we sleep. In amsaktaha farhamha bima tarham bihi ibadaka salihin wa in arsaltaha Fahfadha. You know, if you if you hold on to my soul after taking it, then have mercy on it. And if you return my soul, then preserve it and protect it. Wamin ayatihi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Rum, Wamin ayatihi and taquma sama wal ardu bi amrihi. Thumma ida da'akum da'wa. مِنَ الْأَرْضِ إِذَا أَنْتُمْ تَخْرُجُونَ Among his signs too is the fact that he, that the heavens and the earth stand firm by his command. In the end, you will all emerge when he calls you from the earth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from his manifest signs that he is expecting that we observe, is the fact that the heavens and the earth stand firm by him, and that we will all emerge by one da'wah, just one call emerge and trillions of human beings will endless will emerge will be resurrected by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then Ibn Ata'illah in his next rhetorical question how can it be conceived that something veils him since he is nearer to you than anything else and this is when he's bringing us into a deeper and deeper theological state. How can anything veil Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he is closer to us than we are to ourselves? 
ولقد خلقنا الإنسان ونعلم ما توسوس به نفسه ونحن أقرب إليه من حبل الوريد We created man We know what his soul whispers to him We are closer to him than his jugular vein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in Surah Qaf, Ayah 16 Allah knows every whisper He knows what the eye steals and takes you know, from a glance, وَمَا تُخْفِي الصُّدُورِ and what the, what the chests hide. Allah knows. He knows the thoughts that we consider. He knows the thoughts that are even deeper and hidden that we've forgotten, but He knows them. Because He is الأول والآخر. So how can something veil us from someone who's so close to me? You know, it's like when I... You go into your child's room at night and they're having a, 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 a bad dream and you console them and you, they're crying and they're screaming and what do you say to them? And they're, Baba, Mama, and they're crying and you say, I'm here, I'm here. And you're holding them tight, but they're still doing what? They're still jittering, they're still crying, they're still screaming, but you're holding them tighter and tighter. And you're in their arms and you're whispering in their ears and you're kissing them on their forehead and you're kissing them on their cheek and you're patting them on their chest and their heart and their back. I'm here, I'm here. But they're not, ah, until what? Until finally they realize and they feel, oh, you've been here the whole time. Oh, there's nothing to worry about. Oh, I was just lost. And that's what Ibn Ata'illah is in a very subtle, beautiful, nuanced way telling us. Allah is right here. Allah is with us all the time. Allah knows everything. How could we ever lose sight of that? And how can we not feel His closeness when He's right here? And, and this is the process of contemplation and thought that Ibn Ata'illah is challenging us to consider so that we become closer and more aware and more aware of Him. جَلَّ فِي عُلَى وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ Allah, as he says in the Qur'an, He is with you wherever you are. وَهُوَ اللَّهُ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْفِي الْأَرْضِ يَعْلَمُ سِرَّكُمْ وَجَهْرَكُمْ وَيَعْلَمُ مَا تَكْسِبُونَ Allah says in Surah Al-An'am, He is God in the heavens and on the earth. He knows your secrets and what you reveal and He knows what you do. Allah is with us with His knowledge and by His knowledge. Allah is with us all the time. Wherever we are, Allah is with us. Bi'ilmihi, by His knowledge, bi rahmatihi, by His mercy. And this is as we noted before, He is fi, Allah fi, meaning that Allah is in, in realities by His sifat, by His characteristics and His traits. We never, we never say that Allah is physically in, hasha jalla fi ula, but Allah is with and in and around and everywhere by his sifat, by his characteristics, and by his his knowledge. And as we start to conclude, inshallah, and if you have any questions or thoughts, please share them so that when I'm done, we can respond to them. He says, How can it be conceived that something veils him, since were it not for him, the existence of everything would not have been manifest? You know, that's a very humbling consideration. How can we be veiled by anything? How could, how could it be conceived that something veils him since we, were it not for him, the existence of everything would have not been manifest? None of this needed to even exist. You and I, there was no need for us to exist. We exist purely by his lutf, by his grace. I've shared this in some of my classes. My mother always tells me the story of how when she was pregnant with me that all of the doctors were telling her to abort this, the, the, the child because the child is going gonna, is gonna to be you know, defected and very ill and it may have a harmful impact on you. And she would share every year, you know, every year she would share this story with me. And, and until it hit me, subhanAllah, and, and you know, she even had a sheikh back then who, who, who told her, you know, that, that you can abort this child given the circumstances and what the doctor, doctors are saying. And, and something in her told her no. To, you know, she said, no, inshallah, this child will be a child that 
you know, takes me to Jannah. And, uh, you know, may Allah, may Allah make that, may Allah make it so, Ya Rabb. May Allah guide us and help us and forgive us. And then, you know, uh, she said that when you came out, I looked at you and I was, I was expecting to see a monster, you know. And then I saw you and you looked completely normal. And, and she said to my father, she said, this is the child that they wanted me to abort. <laughs> and subhanAllah, you know, um, I remember a few years ago when she shared the story with me for the, you know, umpteenth time, I said to myself, subhanAllah, you know, if she had just made the decision to abort, you know, um, and of course her decision to not abort or to abort, of course, billah, by Allah. But if, if everyone was telling her to abort, and then she something in her said, no, I'm not going to abort, regardless of what all the doctors are saying, or even regardless of what the shiyukh are saying. And then I came out. And I could have easily not been here. None of us. Me. And you who are listening to me now, and you know the people who, who, who watch this, they wouldn't have even known that I existed, none of you. Not even my siblings or my closest of kin, even my mother would have completely forgotten about me. I would have been a, some figment of her imagination. Yeah, there was a child a couple of decades ago that I was going to have, and then, you know, they uh, just aborted him. And none would, it would have been, no, you know, none the wiser. <laughs> Everyone, the world would have proceeded beautifully, and, and no one would have cared, and the world would be sustained, meaning that my presence is one that is inconsequential. And you know what, brothers and sisters? All of your presence, inconsequential. And you know all of this, all of this creation? Inconsequential. The only thing that matters is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how, you know, how can we be veiled from him when this is the truth? This is what Ibn Atayla is noting. And lastly, as he closes this hikmah, and I know it's been a long one and a heavy one, but a rich one, inshallah. May Allah accept and help us. He says, it is a marvel how being has manifested in non-being. And how the contingent has been established alongside of whom possesses the attribute of eternity. And this is almost uh, uh, um, him commenting on us. Ya ajaban kayfa yadhharu al-wujudu fi al-adam. You know, how marvelous is it that we seemingly exist in nothingness. So here is nothingness, which is the reality of everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then in that space of nothingness, something seemingly exists, which is the creation. And he is marveling at that. Because if you affirm all of this stuff that he has been logically, in this form of like logical progression, bringing us to, then how do we even you know, seemingly exist? You know, how are we observably existent? SubhanAllah. And he's saying, I'm كَيْفَ يَثْبُتُ الْحَادِثُ مَعْ مَنْ لَهُ وَصْفُ الْقِدَمْ And how, you know, and how the contingent has been established alongside of whom possesses the attribute of eternity. You know, here, we are all created beings, contingent beings, and Allah is Al-Qadim. Allah is the everlasting, the absolutely existent. Al-awwal wal-akhir. And how do we even register alongside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Meaning to say, those of us who are mahjubin, those of us who are veiled, wake up. Wake up because it's not even conceivable that we are registering in the divine orbit when everything is an indication of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I hope and pray, my dear brothers and sisters, that we can take this very rich and heavy hikmah 
and take it to our um, space of, of khalwa, our spiritual retreats. And as we, he mentioned a few hikam ago, the idea of that the qalb comes to life in the maidan of the fikra, when we take into the, the space of, of, of thought and contemplation and we think and consider all of these truths about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we project them onto our realities and we realize we have been these very fidgety, fickle, you know, senseless, at times deluded beings not realizing that everything and anything is Allah Jalla fi Ula and everything and anything is by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything and anything is for Allah and that bi-ithnillahi ta'ala when we contemplate that and internalize that and realize that then what happens is liberation is freedom is a beautiful disconnectedness from the self and then you're plugged into the divine reality, your ruh is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then you exist in the divine orbit. And then that's that's life. That's where you begin to you know shift and change and, and be beautified in the presence of Al Latif, Al Jameel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the subtle one, the beautiful one, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. So and and as I said, that this these hikam of Ibn Ata'illah they are really, they are all culminated into one maqula, one dhikr of the afkar that we are taught, one and one type of remembrance, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, that there is no power, no might, no nothing, except by and through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to be humble, to be beautiful in our loving surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah help us to internalize these meanings and to become closer and closer and more aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and cognizant of Him and, and aware of um, His presence everywhere and anywhere bi ta'ala and may we become only more and more mindful of Him and more and more conscious of Him in all of these subtle manifestations that Ibn Ata'illah has taught us to notice inshallah barakallahu feekum wa taqabbalallahu minna wa minkum wa maramadan kareemun wa mubarak um, barakallahu feekum Sheikh Fahmi May Allah bless you Sheikh Abdul Hamid uh, Andrew MashaAllah Barakallahu feekum um, We have a question here How do we conceive of the eternity of the Akhirah Even and hell in relation to Allah's eternal nature Oh this is a The, the, the Akhirah The eternity of heaven and hell Is contingent itself It is by the creation And by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Meaning that Heaven is eternal As Allah deems it eternal as Allah makes it eternal. Heaven is not eternal on its own. Hell is not eternal on its own. So you, you understand. So Allah wills that it's going to have a type of eternal quality. But it certainly is not like the eternal nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which there is nothing outside of Allah that can restrict or control or elongate or shorten Allah's eternal nature, nothing. However, Allah can. Allah is the one who willed that heaven will be eternal and that hell would be eternal. So it's a very simple uh, relationship between the creator and the created. Heaven and hell are created realities. And the eternity of heaven and hell are created realities as well. Inshallah, I will... Oh, there's a question that was submitted... How do you feel Allah's uh, with will in your life? For example, is qadr of every day, is qadr of every day of your life? Absolutely, qadr, the will of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, is manifested every nanosecond of my life. There is nothing that happens in my life, or in your life, or in anyone's life outside of the will of Allah. So Allah's will is manifest all the time. قُلْ لَنْ يُصِيبَنَا إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَنَا Everything that will come to touch us or be by us or with us um, is only by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That which He has prescribed for us. He is Al-Qadir, right? So Allah is the one who wills every reality. بِفَضْلِهِ وَبِكَرَمِهِ And by His will and by His manage, majestic ability. And then for us, from our side, it is a matter of 
experientially our intentions, what we intend to do, and what we try to do, and what we do by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what we are going to be held accountable for, what we intend to do and what we do by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Barakallahu feekum. Yes, I know these meanings, uh, Umm Umar, are heavy, uh, but insha'Allah ta'ala, I hope and pray that, you know, we, we are up to the challenge. You know, I, 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 when I was reading this hikmah, and I myself am still wanting to read more and more shuruh. I read maybe three or four explanations of this hikmah, and some of them were, you know, 40 pages long of one hikmah, one wisdom, subhanAllah, 40 pages. And I still feel that I want to read more and explore more and go deeper and deeper into this hikmah. And all of these hikam, because they are all treasure troves. And so often people will ask me, you know, how do I think and how do I reflect? Allah says, for people who reflect and for people who know and for people who contemplate, people who have li'ulil alba, people who have their innermost hearts. This is the how, you know. It's taking the, the knowledge of the ulama and the inspirations of the ulama and operationalizing them every single day in my life. I can tell you, you can spend an hour contemplating over a wisdom like this. I challenge, do it tonight, you know. Take this hikmah, you've heard a very high level explanation of this hikmah for me. At the very least, each one of the sentences have been unlocked, which was what our ulama would do for us. They would basically unlock each sentence. I'm sure that the way you conceive of this hikmah now, compared to conceiving of it before, is very different. But now, I have just opened up the door by the will of Allah. Now go in deeper and deeper and deeper and process more and more. You know, sharing with one of my beloved mashayikh and ahibba uh, that, you know, he was asking me how, is the, how, is the, how are the hikam classes going? And I say, I don't know that people really appreciate that I am the one benefiting the most from these hikam because the amount of time that goes into reading these hikam and analyzing, and I have three or four shuruh, I've showed you the sharh, here's one right next to me, the sharh of Sidi Ahmed Zarruq that I've read to you from the past, and, and other shuruh, other explanations of the hikam, it's just a sea without shores of reflections and meanings, and so, you know, please take it upon yourself to contemplate deeper and deeper, and challenge yourself to go beyond the superficial. I know, you know, I know that the nature of education today, and how things are consumed, People don't have a bandwidth for an hour lecture on one hikmah of Ibn Atayla. I know that. <laughs> I'm not naive to that. And I know that, you know, we're, we're accustomed to, we, we, we're really programmed to wanting, you know, stories and, um, you know, nice five-minute clips, which are good. We're, we're, there's khir in them, don't get me wrong. But if I want to go deep, and I want to be, I want to get really enriched by the sacred tradition, then I'm going to have to roll up my sleeves and spend some quality time in this maidan of fikrah, in this space of contemplation and, and reflection. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to uh, be more thoughtful and more committed and more willing to spend quality time in, in beautiful contemplation. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as iftar is, is going to be with us shortly. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and يَفْتَحْ عَلَيْنَا فُتُوحَ الْعَارِفِينَ بِكْ You know, we ask you Allah to grant us the opening of the, those who, who, who you've given openings to amongst your arifin, those who know you. And we ask you Allah that you take us on the path of wilaya, on the path of, of, of being amongst your sacred companions and those who are with you and, and those who, Ya Allah, see you and recognize you and affirm you and, and live. And